Hey guys, this is Peter with the Command Valley bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video and all the videos on our channel. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing it, check out the link in the description below. We have a copy and pasteable deck list in the description that you can paste right in their deck builder and buy your singles there and they'll ship them right to you. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. Today I am building kind of an impromptu deck tech on Essex Fractal Bloom, one of the side commanders from the new 2021 Commander Precons. Essex is a legendary creature fractal. It costs four, a green, and a blue, and is a 4-4 four, four with flying. It says, the first time you would create one or more tokens during each of your turns, you may instead choose a creature other than Essex Fractal Bloom and create that many tokens that are copies of that creature. So I'm a big fan of ridiculous token strategies like what I see with Essex. What this reminds me of most is one of my first real serious commander decks, which was Brutaclad Telcor Engineer. And comparing these two cards, I want to say that Brutaclad is strictly better because of the fact that it makes tokens at the beginning of combat, and it can copy all existing tokens rather than simply when they enter the battlefield. However, Essex has two legs up on Brutaclad that I want to exploit with this deck, both of which involve the color green. So let's get right into the deck tech by talking about our win cons. The first leg up that it has is that it can play Avenger of Zendikar and other green creatures that make a lot of tokens when they enter the battlefield. Avenger is obviously a big win con in a lot of green creature based decks, and with Essex we can copy the original Avenger of Zendikar to get an absolutely absurd amount of plant tokens, which will only get exponentially bigger because of the amount of Avengers we have anytime we play a land. That's some serious value right there, and this is not the only card that can accomplish something like this, as we also have Hornet Queen and Deep Forest Hermit being able to create four tokens each upon entering, and Michael Loth, which will take advantage of the lots of tokens that we have on the battlefield and give us a nasty amount of tokens on our future upkeeps. With these green cards, we can hopefully have explosive turns and overwhelm the board with a go-wide strategy. Even though they don't have haste, the next turn we'll be able to overwhelm the board if we can protect our board for that long. The second leg up we have on Brutaclad is that we have a great alternate win con at our disposal, which is Biovisionary. Biovisionary simply requires four copies of itself in order to win the game at our end step. And so, even if our strategy of going wide doesn't really work out against our matchups, we can have this win out of nowhere card come in and then one of our mass token creators making a bunch of tokens that will copy Biovisionary. I, I've been looking for a chance to use Biovisionary and this seems like the perfect opportunity to take advantage of it. As a backup, we similarly have Mechanized Production, which we can enchant an artifact with, and if we have eight copies of that artifact at our upkeep, we'll win. This is a bit worse than Biovisionary here, especially because we would have to target an artifact creature in order for it to be able to be taken advantage of with Essex, and it triggers at the upkeep so it gives our opponents time to deal with it but it can also work to give us the win in this high token copying strategy if Biovisionary doesn't work out. All right, let's move into the meat of the deck with our token makers. Everything else that makes tokens, even if they aren't necessarily the best token makers, we want stuff to take advantage of Essex basically at all times, so we need a high volume of these things. With this list, we're specifically looking for things that won't just make one token at the upkeep, which is potentially the worst way to utilize Essex because it takes away our opportunity for explosive turns because Essex only triggers once per turn. There are a few exceptions that we'll talk about, but you won't see any Awakening Zone or Thopter Spy Network here because of that. Let's start with our Planeswalkers, which include Garuk, Primal Hunter. Garuk can make a creature token every turn, which is great, but also if we get to that ult, we can make a 6-6 green worm creature token for every land that we control, which is fantastic. It's going to make a whole bunch of creatures for us, and we can make them copies of something impactful, and maybe that's enough to overwhelm the board. 
We also have Kiora, Master of the Depths, which will most of the time just be kind of a mana advantage sort of piece because that plus one lets us untap a creature and a land. But in Magical Dreamland, where we get to that ult, that's going to be really impactful for all of our creature tokens from then on to be able to fight creatures as soon as they enter and making three creature tokens on the spot. Moving on to our creatures, we have first Adrix and Nev Twim Casters. These are the face commander for the deck that Essex come in, and honestly, they just work so great together. I had to include here because it's basically a doubling season for everything that Essex wants to do. In addition, if we can find a way to copy Adrix and Nev, even better. Next, we have Arasta of the Endless Web, which will make a spider with reach every time an opponent casts an instant or sorcery. Now, this is kind of an oddball include for me because... First of all, it doesn't really work well with Essex, it only creates one token, and it has the potential for interference from our opponents by them casting things before we have the chance to cast something else and make a lot of tokens on our turn and kind of sabotage our turn by triggering Essex before we have the chance to do something. So maybe this isn't the best include for the deck. But I looked at Arasta and I figured this is a great way to get a whole bunch of creature tokens while it is not our turn. And then they can be fuel for the fire for things like Mycoloth for us to get a ton of value from that and some other cards that we'll talk about later. Next, we have Chasm Skulker, which whenever you draw a card, you will put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And then when it dies, you make X one one squids with Island Walk, where X is Chasm Skulker's power. So this is going to gradually get bigger and bigger the longer it takes for your opponents to deal with it. And when it comes out, they're going to become copies of basically whatever we want. And by that time, we'll probably have something that is massively impactful for it to copy. Next, we have Coma Cosmos Serpent. So this is one of the ones where we're going to be making just one token at our upkeep. But the fact that we get four tokens from a complete turn cycle at the table really helps for our go wide strategy. And Coma is a really good engine for protecting our board as well. So this is obviously going to be targeted pretty quick because of the value it provides and the fact that we can tap down our opponent's stuff so that they can't really attack us as efficiently as they would like. This is one of the ones I'm most iffy about including just because of that stipulation that it makes a creature token at our upkeep and that ruins our chances of using Essex later in the turn. But I want to see how it goes and see if the value that it creates from creating so many tokens outvalues what value we could get from Essex in a single turn. Next, we have Sharding Sphinx, which has flying, and whenever an artifact creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may create a 1-1 blue Thopter artifact creature token with flying. This will only trigger Essex for one of the tokens because all of those triggers for all of your artifact creatures trigger separately, but it can help you start to multiply how many tokens you have on the board, and again, contribute to going wide. And finally, we have Worm Coil Engine, which seems like a great target to copy itself and make a whole bunch of tokens when they die, a lot of protection for our board. Making two tokens when it dies, it's not bad. It can be useful for limited circumstances, but Worm Coil Engine is just such a beast on its own that I feel like it merits a place in the deck and it creates tokens, so that's pretty good too. Moving on to our non-creature token makers, we have Body of Research which this blew my mind, will basically, with Essex, make a copy of one of our creatures we control, and then we put X plus one plus one counters on it with X equal to the number of cards in our library. This is huge. This is going to make something in our deck absolutely massive. And obviously this is only going to work with one creature unless we can make multiple creatures with like Ajax and Nev or something like that. But having that massive creature is going to be a great benefit one way or another. Next is Clone Legion. Obviously copying every creature on another person's board is great, but having all of those copies become one creature is even better. Next is Curse of the Swine, which I found to be a pretty versatile card. You can use it as a removal spell 
for other people, but you could also use it for your own stuff, make yourself a whole bunch of boar tokens and then have them turn into something else. Very powerful, versatile card. Similarly, Azuri's Predation will create you a whole bunch of tokens based on how many creatures your opponents have, and you can have them become whatever you want, and then obviously they're going to fight each other creature on the board, so you'll want to copy something big. Next is Rite of Replication, which can make five copies of a single thing at once. Obviously not like super versatile because we could target any creature with Rite of Replication, but still a great token maker for the deck and hard to not include. We then have Second Harvest, which will basically double the number of tokens that we have on the battlefield and we can have them all enter as a copy of something. Moving on to some artifacts that we have, First is Blade of Selves, which is going to give something Myriad, which is going to basically create two tokens that are attacking other players. Blade of Selves is a great token maker in the deck. Similarly, we have Essica's Chariot, which will create two tokens when it enters the battlefield, again, entering as copies of whatever we want. And we can also use it as a copy spell for other tokens if it attacks. Next, we have Helm of the Host, because attaching this to a legendary creature, how could you resist, really? It's really powerful to be able to get another creature every turn. And if we want, we can turn those into something else if it's our first one in the turn. And last, we have Mimic Vat, which is only going to create one token, but it is going to help us protect creatures that are removed before we have the chance to copy them, which leads me to my next topic about things to copy. Okay, in this section, we have a couple of things that we want to copy, and they kind of overlap with other things that we have in the deck, other themes, other card advantage, stuff like that, but these are really just the valuable cards to copy. Let's start with Biomathematician, which when it enters, it's going to create a fractal token. And then it's going to put a plus one plus one counter on each fractal we control. If we copy this with one of our mass copy spells, we're going to not only get a whole bunch of biomathematicians, we're also going to get a whole bunch of fractals and they're going to get exponentially bigger based on how many creature tokens we just put down. Additionally, our commander is a fractal, so this helps pump our commander up, which will protect it a little bit. Next, we have Coiling Oracle, which when it enters, you look at the top card of your library. If it's a land, you put it onto the battlefield, otherwise you put it into your hand. So it's pretty good at card advantage, kind of a ramp piece, just a pretty good Simic card. Having a whole bunch of copies of this is going to get you pretty deep into your library and get a whole bunch of cards into your hand, a whole bunch of lands onto the battlefield, can really help you out in a pinch. Next is End Raise Forerunners, which is kind of a finisher in the deck. Already when you cast it, it's going to give everything plus two plus two Vigilance and Trample until end of turn, which is going to be really valuable. The other thing I really like about End Raise Forerunners is that it has haste, so if you do end up copying it with a whole bunch of things like your Avenger of Zendikar, all of those tokens are going to come in not only pumping up all of your other creatures, plus two, plus two, trample and vigilance, but they're also going to all have haste, which means you can really explosively win out of nowhere. Next we have Orin Frostfang. Now, Orin Frostfang has two abilities. The first one gives everything that's attacking death touch. Obviously copying that doesn't do anything more for you, but whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card that does copy with each copy of Orin Frostfang. So having a whole bunch of copies of these, swinging with a whole bunch of creatures, you're going to draw a whole bunch of cards if anything lands. Plus, you're doing a lot of damage anyways. Next, we have Pentavis, which you have to pay mana in order to remove counters from it and make tokens. And obviously, you're only making one token at a time. But again, this contributes to our go-wide strategy. And if you have a whole bunch of them, then you can just continue to make creature tokens that will help protect you. And they have flying, so this can get around a lot of evasion that your opponents are swinging at you as long as you have the mana. Next we have Rampaging Balos, which is a pretty good token maker on its own, but it doesn't really do what we want it to do in this deck because it only creates one token every time we play a land. But if we have a whole bunch of copies of these, having a bunch of 4-4 green beast tokens created every time we play a land is super impactful for our go white strategy. And last in this category, I've included Imperious Perfect, which is a really good elf tribal 
card, but I'm putting it in here because we can pay a green and tap it to create a token. And having a whole bunch of these, tapping them for the mana that we can afford to spend on them and, and very quickly create a whole bunch of really powerful elves is pretty impactful. And this card recently went down a lot in price because of the pre-con from call time, so pick one up now. All right, moving on to our ramp section. First, I wanna start with a card that is kind of a curveball in this deck, but I put it in here for a very specific reason. It's Beast Caller Savant. It has two defining properties. First, it can tap for one mana of any color, and you can only use that mana to cast creature spells. Now, we do have quite a few creature spells in this deck, and this can be really good for getting our commander out and other things, but the most important part of this card is that it has haste. What this means is that if we do end up making a whole bunch of copies of this, first we have the option to have a whole bunch of mana to our disposal if we have some sort of a big impactful creature in our hand that we want to cast immediately. The other utility here is that they have haste, which means they can instantly attack. And so if we make a ridiculous amount of tokens and they all come in as copies of Beast Caller Savant, we can surprise attack someone out of nowhere. Additionally, in this deck, we have Finhorn Elves, Lanawar Elves, and Mara Leaf Pixie, all of which are pretty good mana dorks that we can, if we need to, copy with a whole bunch of tokens. We also have Solemn Simulacrum here, which is an all-star in the deck, being able to tutor us a whole bunch of lands if we copy it. Very, very powerful in the deck, and if they die, we get a whole bunch of cards too. Great card. Moving on to our non-creature spells, we have Cultivate, Rampant Growth, Sky Shroud Claim, and Three Visits as our land tutors. We also have Growth Spiral if you want a card draw and if you have a land stuck in your hand. And then we have also included Arcane Signet and Soul Ring as some great mana rocks. Moving on to our card advantage section. First, let's start with Greater Good. Now, I've found that sacrificing creatures in this deck can have a lot of utility, especially if that creature is like a Solemn Simulacrum that wants to go to the graveyard. So that's primarily what it's in here for as a sack outlet, but this can also help us dig through the deck and find our Bio Visionary, our Avenger of Zendikar, or something impactful for us to close out a game. Next we have Elemental Bond, which is absurd with the amount of things that we can copy and create a whole bunch of tokens of and just draw a whole bunch of cards really, really impactful to have on the board. Next is Shamanic Revelation, because we're obviously trying to do a go-wide strategy, having something that draws a card for each creature that we control is really, really powerful, and we have a, enough creatures that have power four or greater that that life gain at the end can also be really impactful. Additionally, we have Return of the Wild Speaker. This is going to help with our creatures that get massive, or it's going to help us finish out a game if we have a bunch of tokens and we go wide they're all going to swing in with extra power. Next, I've included Biden of Thassa because it's easier in a go-wide strategy to do combat damage to a player and draw some cards off of that, so that's really nice. And if we need to, we can use that second ability to kind of control our opponents a little bit. And last, we have Idol of Oblivion. There's not going to be a lot of turns that we aren't making tokens, especially after our commander is out. And so having an extra card draw every turn is really nice. Moving on, let's go to our interaction and protection section. So I have a couple of counter spells in here because we're playing blue and we may as well take advantage of that. I've got Arcane Denial, Counter Spell, and Spell Swindle. I included Spell Swindle here because it creates a bunch of tokens and we can have those tokens enter as copies of another creature we control instead of coming in as treasures, which can sometimes be more impactful. And if it happens first on our turn, you know, we do have to counter something. Even if you don't cast this during your turn and take advantage of that, getting a whole bunch of treasures back for that is pretty impactful. And then I've included one board wipe in this deck and that is Perplexing Test. This can either return all creature tokens to their owner's hands or all non-token creatures to their owner's hand, and it's at instant speed, which is really, really good for us because returning all non-token creatures to their hands, leaves, leaving us with a board with a whole bunch of tokens, will not only give us the opportunity to recast some of our powerful ETB effects, but will give us the advantage on the board because we're going to be utilizing tokens better than anyone else. For our protection section, let's start with Druid's Deliverance. 
which is a fog effect preventing all damage that would be dealt to us this turn and it will let us populate i feel like this is pretty good for the deck and it synergizes well with our strategy Next, we have Fresh Meat. This can be a pretty good recovery from a board wipe, letting us create a creature token for each creature that we put in our graveyard from the battlefield this turn. I'm a little bit on the fence with this one because we don't have a lot of ways to do this ourselves and make a whole bunch of tokens that are copies of something. I wanted to see how it performed and this can help us just kind of hold on until we can recuperate from a board wipe. The next couple are just for the purpose of protecting Essex, which are Veil of Summer, Lightning Greaves, and Swiftfoot Boots. We want to be able to protect our commander from being targeted by things like spot removal, and these are great ways to do that. We also have Asceticism, which will protect all of our creatures from spot removal and give us the opportunity to regenerate a creature after it's destroyed, if it comes to that. That's the basis of this deck, but let's go over the mana base real quick. Not a lot of surprises here. The one utility land that I have in here is Mosswort Bridge because it's very easy to have a total of 10 power on the board and we can get some sort of utility off of the top of our library with our hideaway ability. And then we're playing a whole bunch of dual lands. We have Bark Channel Pathway, Botanical Sanctum, Breeding Pool, Flooded Grove, Hinterland Harbor, Rejuvenating Springs, Temple of Mystery, Vine Glimmer Snarl, Waterlogged Grove, and Yavimaya Coast. We also have a command tower, 15 forests, and 11 islands. This deck is more heavily green focused because green is pretty good at making tokens where blue lacks in that regard. So keep that in mind as you're trying to balance out your mana base. Mana base doesn't matter too much here and you can make it more budget just as long as you keep the balance of forest to island pretty clear. And that's it for my Essex deck. Obviously, I haven't had a lot of time to play the deck because as I'm recording this, the commander was revealed today. So I'm curious to see what other possibilities exist with it. And I would be happy to see in the comments what you could do to power Essex up even more. Let me know what you think about all of this. This deck, I feel, is a bit lacking on the protection as Essex is likely going to be a heavy target as it has to be there for those impactful turns. And I feel like Essex's mana cost makes this deck a little bit slower because it's so high. So I'd love to see what all of your solutions are to these problems. If you enjoyed this deck tech and want to support us directly, head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today. We have some sweet perks. We get to play games over Discord. We talk a lot about these spoilers and talk about brews. You get a lot of the deck techs and gameplays early and there's so much more to be had by being a patron. So go check out the page, patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video and all of the videos on our channel. They have been a great partner to us. If you go through the link in the description, it's an affiliate link. You can buy your commander decks there. You can buy your commander singles there. Anything you want, they'll ship it right to you nationwide and anything you buy there will support us as well you can follow us on social media on twitter and on facebook for our latest updates and be sure to watch out for more upgrade techs and more deck techs coming out around the strixhaven commanders thank you for watching and i hope to see you all next time